Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, good morning to all of you. Is it still morning? <laughs> this promises to be an exciting conference after that opening address. And it's going to be more exciting this afternoon when we listen to Hugo Salinas Bryce and the others. I thought that we had concluded our effort to define money, but Bill Steele has reopened the subject uh, this morning in a very daring way. Our conference must ensure that we explain issues relating to money in a manner that be, can be readily understood, not only by those who are present here in this gathering in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia, but also by the hapless multitudes around the world, many of whom are listening to us and viewing us on the internet, who know little or nothing of the subject, but who look to us for guidance. And hence there is an imperative for simplicity and for clarity while avoiding the use of technical jargon. However, we must provide an adequate explanation for the term petrodollar, since our view is that it is symbolically present in a hadith or a saying of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, on which this presentation is based. We must reveal the staggering role that it has played and still plays in sustaining today's unjust monetary system, as well as the equally unjust international banking system. Both of these are absolutely unique phenomena in human economic and monetary history. No one in history has ever experienced this unique injustice and oppression that mankind now experiences in the worlds of money and banking, in the strange worlds of money and banking. And this perhaps explains partly the strange ignorance of the reality of the subject. Our view is that petro money has an even more sinister role to play in the new monetary system which will emerge to replace the, sp the present one, consequent upon the demise of the US dollar. The monstrously unjust role played by the monetary and banking system in the affairs of the world today, and now this is my most important statement. This cannot be adequately explained if we restrict ourselves to purely economic and monetary analysis. Rather, there are important non-economic and monetary questions which must also be answered if we are to fully understand the subject. For example, gold and silver have continuously functioned as money at least in our history. 1400 years of our history. <laughs> Until modern Western civilization emerged with an agenda of establishing its dominion, a strange and mysterious agenda of establishing its dominion over the rest of the world. Western wars of aggression led to colonization of much of the non-European world. And so now I ask some questions. Is it by accident or by design that decolonization resulted in the rest of the non-European world being incorporated into the mysterious and ominous European monetary system in which for the first time in human history, for the first time in human history, Mankind was prohibited by international law from using gold as money, and in which money with intrinsic value was replaced by money with no intrinsic value. Prohibited. Is it by accident or by design 
that the, non, that the new European monetary system supported a European comprised banking system which together operated in such wise that they and their clients grew incredibly wealthy while the rest of the world was imprisoned in increasing poverty and destitution. Has that economic impoverishment led to political servitude? Is it true or is it false that modern political servitude invariably implies conformity with the Zionist agenda? Is it by accident or by design that European Zionist Jews and Zionist Christians have a firm control over that monetary and international banking system and are using it to the advantage of the State of Israel? Is it by accident or by design that the modern secular West continued the Jihad that they call the Crusades? waged by medieval Christian Europe to liberate the Holy Land from Muslim rule until success was finally achieved in 1917? Why did non-European Christians refrain from participating in a Christian Jihad? Why did Western European Christians fight their Eastern Christian brothers in faith? while making their way in a Christian jihad to the Holy Land. And finally, is it by accident or by design that the West then presided over the birth of a state of Israel in the Holy Land, some 2,000 years after Holy Israel had been destroyed by divine decree? And the Jews were then brought back, sometime by hook and sometime by crook, to reclaim the Holy Land as their own some 2,000 years after they were expelled from it by divine decree? Did all of the above take place by accident? Or was it part of a grand design that would eventually make it possible for Israel to rule the world? Why would Israel want to rule the world? The Quran has declared that it has come to explain all things. Surah Al Ma'ida, Surah number 16, verse 89. And we have some of our books uh, Jerusalem and the Quran, uh, The Gold Dinar, and Silver Dirham, Islam, and the Future of Money, in which we have turned to the Quran and turned to the Hadith to try to provide answers to these questions. And what these answers indicate is that there is an eschatological dimension to the subject of contemporary world affairs, which is absolutely indispensable for proper understanding of the subjects of money and the banking. And at the heart of that explanation is the return of the true Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon them both. Who when he returns will rule the world from Jerusalem. Another heart of that explanation is the advent of a false Messiah who will attempt prior to the return of the true Messiah to impersonate the true Messiah. If he is to successfully impersonate him, he would have to do the following. Number one, liberate the Holy Land for the Jews. He's already done that. Number two, bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. He's already done that. Number three, restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and deceive the Jews into embracing it as Holy Israel. He's already done that. Number four, cause that imposter Israel to become the ruling state in the world. I recognize Dajjal, the false messiah, as the actor responsible for all of the above. As a consequence of our Islamic eschatology, 
We were able to understand events unfolding in the world for quite some time now as preparatory to the establishment of a Zionist controlled world government, world economy, and universal currency or global currency. Our eschatology also allowed us to recognize petrol money as located at the very heart of Dajjal's quest to rule the world. We turn now to the European monetary system, which we referred to recently. In the wake of the First and Second World Wars, a new European monetary system was established at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. Agreement was reached among the Western rulers of the world on a monetary system in which only one currency, the US dollar, would be redeemable in gold. You could take the dollar and get the gold at $35 and up. Dr. Mahathir made reference to it. All other currencies in the world would have their value determined in relation to the US dollar. Our Islamic, our Islamic analysis of this strange new monetary system can be found in my book, uh, The Gold in Our and Silver, Dirham Islam and the Future of Money. But this was, in Islam, bidah, an innovation as high as the mountain. It seemed, however, to have escaped Islamic scholarship. Secondly, only governments through their central banks could redeem dollars for gold. Ordinary people could not do that. An institution known as the International Monetary Fund would be established and each member state would be required to deposit 25% of your gold reserves uh, with the IMF. These provisions were in reality quite flimsy and they gave the false impression that the new monetary system was somehow anchored in gold. In fact, the gold that was deposited with the IMF functioned merely as a means through which state could seek loans on interest from the IMF. But more importantly, to the extent that the member state faithfully complied with the requirement of depositing that gold, the IMF would know the extent of gold reserves of each country in the world. This was further assured through the requirement that member states must report to the fund all sales and purchases of gold. What was not disclosed was that the US dollar would remain redeemable in gold only for as long as it was convenient for the U.S. government to honor that obligation. What was not disclosed was that the U.S. dollar would remain redeemable in gold only for as long as it was convenient for the U.S. government to honor that obligation. Just an ominous was the other possibility that the U.S. government could renege on its legal, <coughs> that if the U.S. government could renege on its legal obligation to redeem dollars for gold, it could also refuse to repatriate the 25% of gold that it had stored. Let us pause for a moment to remind those who are unaware that the U.S. government has already abandoned its legal obligation to redeem dollars for gold and now refuses to even audit the gold belonging to the rest of the world that is stored in the United States of America. Strangely and mysteriously, the use of gold as money was prohibited in the Articles of Agreement of the IMF. Nowhere was an explanation offered for this strange prohibition, and conveniently so. No one asks for an explanation not even the scholars of Islam. One of the likely reasons why the Articles of Agreement of the IMF prohibited the use of gold as money, I'm venturing to offer an answer. Number one, to prevent the possibility that gold used as money could challenge and could cause a collapse of the bogus paper money monetary system. Number two, to ensure that gold belonging to the rest of the world was stored in the United States would remain undisturbed in US territory until the time arrives when the monetary system of paper money collapses.
the world then returns to gold as money, as it's coming. At that time, the legal prohibition for the use of gold as money would be removed. And the gold store with his eye on his own and controlled Federal Reserve Bank in New York would then be secretly and illegally transferred to Israel. That transfer, in fact, may already have taken place. And so the Israel rule over the world of money would remain unchallenged and unchallengeable. The gold stored in the United States will remain largely undisturbed since there would be no reason for a member state to seek repatriation of its gold. What would you do with the gold? You can't use it as money. And number three, once the member states of the IMF had deposited 25% of their gold reserves with the IMF, and member states had begun to take IMF loans that were secured by that gold, it would then be possible to encourage them to store more and more of their gold reserves with the IMF. And if they held on to their gold, if they held on to their gold, they could not use them in any way. And so the provision of the Articles of Agreement uh, prohibiting the use of gold as money opened the way for the United States to eventually be entrusted with the storage of most of the gold reserves in the world. Excuse me. It is absolutely amazing that the world of Islamic scholarship never, never responded. Since 1944, up to this day, to the IMF Articles of Agreement, to point to that Allah Most High made the use of gold and silver and commodities of food consumption as money. He made them halal, gold and silver and articles of food consumption as money. He made it halal. And if you make haram what Allah made halal, if you make haram what Allah made halal, then according to the Quran that is blasphemy, that's shirk, the one sin that Allah would not forgive. Allah had made the use of gold and silver and commodities of food com consumption uh, uh, as money halal. I don't have the time to, to define money more than this in my presentation. And if you make haram what Allah made halal, that is shirk, according to the Quran, Surah Tawbah. And shirk is blasphemy. And the Quran says this is the one sin that Allah will not forgive. If we then use that money which is substituted, what Allah has made halal, they have made haram, and what they have substituted for the gold or for the real money, we then use it, we also now join in the shirk. It is absolutely amazing that the world of Islamic scholarship failed to recognize that since money in the Quran and Sunnah was always money which had intrinsic value, the value of the money is in the money and created by Allah, not by George Soros. If Allah, if Allah had given us money which is always money with intrinsic value, then it was an abandonment of the Quran and of the Sunnah to turn and accept money with no intrinsic value. The paper money was bogus. It was fraudulent. It was haram. But kindly allow me to also say, Islamic banking doesn't appear to have understood that as yet. In addition, in addition, one of the most important functions of the IMF was to provide loans on interest. It used to be usury, but usury became a loaded word, like homosexual had to be changed to gay. So usury had to be changed to interest. One of the most important functions of the IMF was to provide loans on interest to member states. These loans, of course, will be provided from funds deposited with the IMF by such member contributors of the USA. 
and gold deposited with the U.S., with the IMF, could be used to secure such loans. But Allah Most High, in the Quran, in the Torah, in the Gospel, prohibited money being lent on interest. Money has no time value, not with the God who created us. He had prohibited money being lent on interest. And the IMF became the money lender with whom Allah and his messenger were waging war. And with whom the Prophet ﷺ had issued a curse. He cursed all four. The one who took riba, the one who gave riba, the one who recorded the transaction and the two witnesses. Despite all of the above, the strangely silent world of Islamic scholarship saw nothing and did nothing to warn Muslims and to prevent Muslim membership in the IMF. In fact, the only challenge to the new international monetary system that emerged in the first 25 years of its existence came from France. I wish I had the time to tell you what de Gaulle, President Charles de Gaulle did, but the French challenge eventually led to the United States reneging on its obligation to redeem dollars for gold. And so Bretton Woods collapsed in August 1971. Would Islamic scholarship now take the opportunity with the collapse of Bretton Woods to articulate an Islamic conception of money and of a monetary system? My research has led me to only one book written by Umar Chapra entitled Towards a Just Monetary System. Other than that, the world of Islamic scholarship remained mysteriously silent. Nor were the French able to grasp the opportunity presented by the collapse of Bretton Woods in August 1971 to lead an effort for the establishment of a new and a better monetary system. Instead, within just two years of the collapse of Bretton Woods, the Americans pulled the rabbit With its two years of the collapse of Bretton Woods, the Americans pulled the rabbit out of the bag and stunned the world in the wake of the October 1973 Arab-Israeli war and the simultaneous Arab oil embargo in the United States with the surreptitious establishment of a stunningly cunning petrodollar monetary system. What was that system? Before we turn to it, let us quote the hadith of Prophet Muhammad on which this paper is based. The Prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him, that among the signs of the last day is that the river Euphrates would uncover a mountain of gold. He said the people would fight for that gold, and 99 out of every 100 would be killed. But each one of them would expect to be the one in a hundred who would survive. He went on to warn that whoever is present at that time should not take of, the, of that gold, Sahih Bukhari. The river Euphrates did uncover a mountain of gold less than a hundred years ago. It was black gold namely oil. And there have been constant wars, one after the other since that time, for control over that black gold. We'll explain in a moment how the petrodollar came into being when an ocean of oil, an ocean of oil commenced functioning as a mountain of gold in a new petrodollar monetary system. However, the world still has to experience such wars over which 99 over 100 out of every 100 would be killed, meaning wars with such weapons of mass destruction, which would cause such colossal deaths. It is unclear whether those wars over the mountain of gold 
would culminate in the Malhama or the great war prophesied by the Prophet. Such a great war would substantially reduce the human population in the world. And then tiny Israel would have far less difficulty in ruling the world. Our view is that we were prohibited from taking any of that mountain of gold because that monetary system in which oil will now be used as gold would function as an instrument for the enslavement of mankind. To the extent that we used it, we would eventually be enslaved. And now the road to the petrodollar. There's evidence which strongly suggests that the Arab-Israeli War of 1973 was stage managed. It led to the, uh, the Arab-Israeli War and the oil boycott of the United States. It led to the spectacular rise in the price of oil from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel, 400% rise in the price of oil. The spectacular rise in the price of oil not only benefited the American and British owned oil companies, but also, more importantly, the largely Arab oil producing countries. The windfall in Arab oil revenues created an opportunity that was cleverly exploited by the United States to seek to replace a monetary system based on gold, or superficially based on gold, as Bretton Woods, with a new one based on oil. In other words, the Americans wanted oil to function as gold in a new petrol monetary system. Henry Kissinger, the American Secretary of State, successfully negotiated with Saudi Arabia's King Faisal an agreement requiring oil to be sold for only US dollars. Saudi Arabia then persuaded the Arab, other Arabs to join, and that's the birth of the petrodollar. Excuse me. The Saudi king is unlikely to have realized that he had signed into the creation of an evil monetary system that was prophesied by his own prophet. As a result of that agreement, oil now functioned as gold on behalf of the U.S. power. The agreement was manifestly haram. Prophet Muhammad insisted on the preservation of a free and fair market. Any agreement requiring oil to be sold for only gold, sorry, Requiring oil to be sold for only U.S. dollars constituted a violation of the free market. And since the U.S. dollar could no longer be redeemed for gold, it was also a violation of the fair market. The United States no longer had to bother about the relationship between gold reserves and the quantity of U.S. dollars in circulation. No. The price of gold could rise to infinity without posing any threat real threat to the U.S. dollar. In other words, an opportunity was created for the Federal Reserve to create as much money as it wanted with the sky as the limit, and to then feed that money into the banking system. And as the banks lend that money on interest, the newly created money would then be legally recognized as money. Indeed, the world has moved away from Printing paper, as Dr. Mahathir explained this morning, all you have to do is sign a check for seven trillion dollars. Kissinger also got agreement that windfall profits that would now come to the Arab oil producing states from the ever rising price of oil consequent upon the ever falling value of the dollar would be invested in Western banks in what common people recognize as fixed deposits. They would invest in the petrodollars in U.S. Treasury bonds, for example. And so petrodollars would, be tra would transform them into money lenders on interest. I suspect that the quid pro quo for this agreement was a secret defense treaty in which the United States guaranteed the security of the state of Saudi Arabia. We are now located 
at that moment in the historic process, when from our eschatological perspective, the jar is about to transit to the third and final stage of his mission. And you read Jerusalem in the Quran, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. In the first stage of his mission, about which the Prophet ﷺ had spoken, the world experienced the emergence of Pax Britannica, with the sterling pound emerging as an international currency. Now, it didn't happen by accident. In stage two, Pax Americana replaced Pax Britannica, and the US dollar replaced the sterling pound as the international currency. This is not by accident. And our view expressed in Jerusalem in the Quran, which was published in 2002, <coughs> is that Pax Judaica will replace Pax America, and a new international currency will replace the US dollar. We do not know whether that new in international currency would be the Israeli shekel or the bank or, or whether the Zionist bankers will coin a new name for electronic money. Whatever be the name of that new international currency or global money that would succeed the US dollar, it should be clear that it will be based on the same petro money foundation as the petrodollar. This would not be possible without an alliance between Israel and the Arab oil producing states, Saudi Arabia in particular. So we are now able to understand more clearly why Prophet Muhammad Allah's blessings be upon him made that ominous declaration concerning Najd. That's where the Saudi rulers have emerged, Najd. He said that from Najd would come the horns of Satan. The greatest of all dangers posed by the petro money monetary system is that allows, it allows the Zionist controlled banking system to create as much money as they wish. There is no legal limit to the creation of money. The sky is the limit. And then they will lend it to Egypt. And then Egypt will have to tow the line to get the IMU flown. There is no legal limit to the creation of money. The wealth can then be used to enslave those who oppose Israel while enriching those who support Israel. In fact, many people in the world today already live at the door of that slavery. Now then, to end. How do we respond to the petrodollar? Since Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, gave the order, he said those present at that time should not touch that gold. The implication is that Muslims in particular have a religious obligation to stop using today's paper, plastic, and electronic money that is bogus, that is fraudulent, that is haram. We have counseled a strategy of defiance of the legal prohibition of the use of gold as money. However, in view of the possibility of state violence in response to gold being used as money, since the IMF prohibits the use of gold as money, including gold coins being seized by the state, and since there is no legal prohibition of the use of silver as money, Hugo Salinas Price must be smiling now. Since there is no legal prohibition of the use of silver as money, Muslims should now lead the rest of the world, or join with the rest of the world, rather, in creating markets in which silver dirhams will be used as a medium of exchange. Whether it's the actual coin, an electronic coin can be debated later. The point is returning to real money. It is unrealistic to assume that there is any possibility of getting petrol money out of circulation in the world of Islam. Hardly any government dares to defy the Zionists. And the ulama or religious scholars of Islam have so far refused to declare paper, plastic, and electronic money now in use to be haram. Consequently, silver dirhams would circulate alongside petro money. What problems are we likely to encounter when silver coins circulate alongside petro money? I hope this conference will take up the problem. How should they be resolved? 
I hope this conference will take up that problem. No one, perhaps, has done more research on this subject, and I urge you to come out this afternoon. No one, perhaps, has done more research on this subject than our next speaker, Hugo Salinas Price of Mexico. Thank you. I'd like to, first of all, thanks, give my thanks to Professor Dr. Ahmed Kamil, the convener and organizer of this conference, and to Mr. Shirazdin Adam Shah, the chairman of the organizing committee, for having thought of inviting me. And also, I must express my appreciation and thanks to Sheikh Imran Hussain, because I think it was his recommendation that uh, led uh, Mr. Shiraz Dean to, to invite me to address you. I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and, and I'm admiring this, this country that is exhibiting such uh, vitality. I can sense the, the vitality in this country. And, and I see you, the Malaysians have done an excellent job here of development. I congratulate you. And also, I was amazed to listen to ex-Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed's address. One of the very, he's a unique politician in the sense that he's, been, he's telling us the truth. And that is some of very rare thing. It was, it was uh, uh, Dr. Mahathir's attempt to, to introduce gold and silver into circulation in this country and then the, the, a news that reached me uh, in Mexico only in a fragmentary way. I didn't know exactly what he was trying to do, so I can't, uh, and I still don't know exactly what he was trying to do. But the news reached me that he was trying to introduce gold and silver into circulation in Malaysia. And this is exactly the theme of the things that I have been thinking about. And, and uh, uh, writing about uh, since 1997, more or less, the last 15 years. And I tried to contact Dr. Mahathir, and I even went to the, to the Mal Malaysian ambassador and gave him a, a, a package of, of uh, writings and articles to forward to Dr. Mahathir, but I never this Undoubtedly, the, a person of his standing receives such piles of mail from all over that he can't he can't attend to everything. So it was a real pleasure to be able to see Dr. Mahathir. I was not able to speak with him, but at least to see him, to shake his hand, and to listen to his words of wisdom. And I have given to him this little uh, booklet, which. I, I have brought from Mexico uh, 1,000 copies and uh, for you, so each one of you uh, can, can have one when I'm through in 45 minutes because I don't want you reading while I'm speaking. So, <laughs> so but uh, here are some, some thoughts that I have put in this, in this, uh, in this uh, pamphlet and it's also accompanied with a little diskette so that you can put this all on your computer and forward it around and comment it if you want. And here are several chapters. The Silver Dirham in Circulation in Malaysia. Two, how to insert the Dirham into a fiat monetary system. Uh, that's, the, that's the crooks. Method to calculate the monetary value of the Dirham. The zero of a dirham and the banking system, the supply of silver, reasons for introducing the silver dirham, the failure, this is a, 
just an annex, sort of philosophical annex, which it mean, which is the title is the failure of mechanistic economics, and so that's the contents of this little book. So, to begin with, let's say let's let's go back to 1940. Now, I, I was born in 1932, but uh, I was born in 32. Now, I don't I I know nothing about how what Malaysia was like in 1940, except perhaps the Japanese were already here. I don't know if they were here or not, but if not, they weren't here. They were on their way. Uh, but I would be I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't silver circulating in Malaysia in 1940. It would not surprise me at all. As a matter of fact, you know, the Mexican silver came to the Far East to, through uh, a ship which used to sail uh, from Acapulco, Mexico, across the Pacific, touching Guam and going on to Manila and unloading its, its cargo of tens of thousands of pieces of eight, which made their way afterwards into China and all parts of Southeast Asia. And that, that, that trade went on for, for some 200 years until we had, uh, until the independence came. Well, independence in a sense, because we became less we became independent of one power, but we became dependent on another power. So that was our independence, and a relative term. Anyway, the whole world in 1940, silver was in use the whole all over the world as as a, as a small as a, a currency uh, for for small denominations and and. At that time, we, we had in Mexico, when I was growing up, this was a, a peso. This is a one peso coin, which circulated in 19, from 1920 to 1945. And you know, during this time, the price of silver went up and down. Now, this coin never had a full one peso worth of silver in it. When it was first coined, it had only about 48 cents, centavos, of, of silver in pesos. Of in, in, less, in other words, 48% of the value of the coin was in silver, and the rest was sovereign uh, seniorage for the central bank. And the, the price of silver went down to as far as about 32 centavos in the depths of the Depression, and that never affected the use of the coin. Nobody ever returned this coin to the to the uh, treasury for redemption because uh, nobody thought that it was necessary. It was immaterial to people that the price of silver had gone down. And many people saved these because afterwards, the, when the price of silver rose, this coin went out of circulation and truckloads truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of these coins were sent off to be melted down because the, the bullion silver was worth more than the coins because they had a stamped value which says one peso on them. In the course of, of those 25 years, there were 468 million of these coins were minted and put into the hands of the people. Now you have a similar case with this half dollar coin, uh, which was minted in 1951. And this coin never had 50 cents worth of silver in it. And silver even went down in value from 1951. I think it even went down somewhat before rising. And again, the same thing happened as to the peso. By 1965, the value of the silver in this coin, this half United States half dollar, the value of the silver in this coin was worth more than 50 cents. And so also large numbers of these coins were melted down. I mention all of this because this is part of the how 
It forms part of the system for reintroducing silver into circulation in this country. It can be done by taking the value of silver, whatever the size of the coin. I'm proposing a three gram coin, but it can be 2.9 grams or it can be 3.2 or whatever you want. Or you can have a larger coin. This is, the system is what is important. You take, the, you take the value of the silver in ringgits. You add the cost of minting in ringgits. Add the two together. Give it, multiply by a, a number which will give the central bank or the treasury a seniorage. I propose 10%. So you multiply by 1.1. Again, this is optional. You can have 1.5. You, you, can, you can double the value, the, the, the value of the silver in turning the, thing in, the, the coin into money. But I propose 10%. Then when you have multiplied the cost of the silver plus the cost of minting by 1.1, you round out the figure to a round number which the people can remember. And that is the way that, the, that silver can be monetized and put into circulation. Why is it necessary to do this? Because it used to be in the, 18th, in the 19th century that what was important for uh, the use of a coin as money was it important to know the weight of silver. And to this day, we have Mexican coins, pieces of eight that came into, for instance, Hong Kong or some other place of China, and were stamped by local merchants because they, they, wanted, they wanted a local stamp that would assure the receiver that that coin had been tested and proved to have the weight it's it supposed to have. So silver was worth, well, it had a monetary value according to weight, but that is no longer the case. Everybody has forgotten how to calculate prices in terms of weight of silver. We, don't, we can't think of that. I mean, we're going to go to the gas station and we're going to, to pay with a weight of silver. Well, the cashier is not going to accept it. I mean, because because how can how can he know what the what the weight is? And it's impossible. We don't think in terms of weight anymore. This was the way things were done before. But humanity has forgotten how to calculate value in terms of weight of silver. Besides, the value of silver is fluctuating. So. We, we, don't, we don't know how to use it if the value is fluctuating. We can save silver as a protection again for the future, but that is also speculation. I think it's a good speculation, but many people are afraid of speculating, especially poorer people. The, the poorer poor people don't want to run the risk of having their savings go down, not even a little bit. It's cost them too much trouble to have a little bit of savings. So the speculation can increase as people have more money and can run the risk of a, of a fall in the value. And, and so we find that people that already have money in a certain amount are the ones that are willing to buy the silver while it's still a commodity. The silver as a commodity changes into money when you follow the process that I am uh, outlining. One, you take the silver. Two, you give it a monetary value that is higher than the value of the silver in the coin. Two, three, if the price of silver rises, then you raise the monetary value so that you restore the profit of the treasury in minting. It continues to be profitable. The coin is not going to be melted down because it's worth more as money than as silver. Okay? And four, critical to this, is that when the price of silver falls, 
the coin retains its value. Just as this coin, a one peso coin, retained its value when the price of silver fell. And just as this coin has retained its value 50 cents until 1965, in the face of falls in the price of silver. What, did, what destroyed these coins, what made them disappear, was rises in the price of silver, which could not be matched by increases in the, in the value. That is why I am recommending a quoted monetary value, not a stamped value. You take, you take the silver, put it into a coin, and attribute a monetary value, but not a stamped value, so that you can raise the price, raise the monetary value of the coin when the price of silver increases. We had an experience in Mexico I will tell you about. Do I still have time? We, we had an experience. In 1945, this coin went out of circulation. I remember as a boy, uh, it was substituted with paper notes. Oh, you know, I was so fascinated to have paper notes because I was 12 years old or 13 years old. And to have a folding money to put in my pocket, that was just wonderful. And for one peso, I didn't know where the thing was going, of course, what was going to happen. But it was so wonderful to have those nice, freshly printed one peso notes. And soon, you couldn't get one, a single one of these. They all disappeared because when the peso notes came out, people helped save these, these pesos. And, and that's what always happens. And uh, what happened then was that instead of the central bank, we have a central bank in Mexico like you have here. Instead of, instead of, uh, instead of being able to raise the, the monetary value of this coin, which they couldn't do because it says one peso, well, they had to go out of the circulation. And they minted a new coin with less silver. So you see, the central bank recognized the increase in the value of silver by reducing the amount of silver in the coin. Now, what I'm proposing is keep the value, keep the silver in the coin and make it circulate permanently so you don't have to ever send this, no one will ever have the temptation to send the coin to the refinery for melting down. But that can only be done if you can alter the, the quoted monetary value. I hope I, that has been made clear. And this, this the process of reducing the amount of silver in the coin went on for several years. Now the original pieces of eight, which were minted in Mexico by the Spaniards for the king of Spain, contained about 24 grams of silver. And by the way, the Mexican pieces of eight, minted for the king of Spain, of course, were the, was the coin that was used as a model for the U.S. silver dollar. If you look it up, you will see that the definition of the U.S. dollar is about 24 grams, because Thomas Jefferson uh, had several different pieces of eight examined, and he found that the average weight of silver in them was 24 grams, and that became the U.S. dollar with a different features but the same amount of silver as the, as the Spanish uh, coin, which was the, the world's dollar at the time was the Spanish uh, silver pieces of eight minted in Mexico. Well, anyway, when my father was born in 1907, those were still, the coin was no longer, had the, the, the symbols of the king of Spain, they all had the symbols of Mexico. And it was no longer called a piece of eight. It was called a peso. A peso means peso means weight, because you see the coin had the same weight, so they called it a peso because it had the weight of the original coin of the King of Spain. And the, in 1907, when my father was born, the doctor was paid 
with the same money that was in use in Mexico since 1535. Sort of remarkable. A remarkable period of stability because we were ruled by a king. And I'm in favor of kings, if they are good kings. Sometimes. Uh, also, rather tepid applause. But anyway, thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't believe too much in a democratic system. Accuse me of being a fascist. No, no, don't accuse me of that. No, I've even forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> well, yes, when my father was born, we had the same amount, the same, uh, this, the same money that was in circulation basically since 1535. Then we had a revolution. This, then, from 24 grams, when the revolution was practically over in 1920. We had, we got this coin with only 12 grams. You see the tendency from 24 to 12. Then this one went out of circulation and another one came in with seven grams, smaller peso. Then that one went out of circulation because the price of silver continued rising because of inflation, paper money printing. We got into paper money printing and and like the rest of the world, we took a little time to get there, but we finally caught up. And the next time, we got another coin with only four, four grams of silver. And then we went to another coin that only had 1.6 grams of silver. It was mainly base metal. And that was the last attempt to have a coin of one peso uh, of silver. And so that was the way that we lost we lost, after several attempts to retain silver, we lost silver in circulation. But we can get it back, and I think we could get it back in permanent form, just like you could. And that's why I've been proposing, well, I, I propose in this, in this little uh, uh, pamphlet, a monetization of a small coin. Uh, I take three grams as a kind of dirham. Perhaps technically the, the dirham would be 2.97 grams or something like that, but I, I didn't have the information, so I, we have some, some authority mentions three grams, so I, we took three grams. And you will see here the, the way, do I have a, do I have a, a, a can we see the, yeah. where is it? More, more, more. I want the graph. That, that one. Well, this graph is a little complicated for you to understand, but you will, if, you, if you look at it uh, with care here, it shows you that you establish an initial value, that's the top line, and if the price of silver in ringgits does not change, it continues. If the price of silver goes up, it increases the monetary value. If the price of silver then falls, it retains the last value. That's the essence of this graph. Also, I should mention that in the legislation that we've presented in Mexico, we have a provision that in the case there is a speculative bubble in the price of silver, the central bank should exercise discretion and refrain from following the boom upward. And I think, I don't have mentioned this before, but I'll mention it now, that there is such a thing as a 200-day moving average. And I think that if the price of silver were to exceed the 200-day moving average by, let us say, 20%, then it would be time for the central bank to say, wait a minute, we're not issuing a new quote until we see that the 200-day moving average is, falls back to a more reasonable uh, distance from the price of silver. The price of silver and the 200-day moving average begin to 
to follow each other instead of uh, following a, a trend which might lead to an excessive overvaluation. I think that would be a prudent thing to do, to avoid excessive overvaluation in case of a, a boom. And I wouldn't doubt that if any country in the world today were to announce that it's going to monetize silver, that would, that would cause an enormous jump in the price of silver overnight because everybody would realize that if one country starts doing this, everybody else is going to do it at the same time. Now, what are the reasons? How much time do I have? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, good. Um, I have some several reasons. Re reasons for, for introducing the silver dirham. The monetary history of the 20th century has been a history of increasing disorder and improvisation in the monetary affairs of the world. The disorder has come to a point where the world no longer uses real money in its transactions. It's bogus money, as Sheikh Imran has mentioned. Consequently, the mass of people in the world do not have a satisfactory and trustworthy means of creating personal savings. The silver coin converted into money would be an excellent medium for personal savings. Furthermore, we are witnessing the development of a worldwide problem, the inability of states to pay the pensions they promised to pay. It is therefore urgent for the population to exert itself to the utmost in providing personal savings for retirement. And saving the monetized silver coin would be the best means to do this. The, bed, the monetized silver coin could not be devalued. There are several reasons, in my view, that make the monetization of silver an attractive and feasible measure for Malaysia. One, the religious reason. This silver coin of three grams plus 0.27 grams of copper to provide hardness is a silver coin prescribed by Islamic Sharia law. Unless I am mistaken, I hope I'm not saying so. It is entirely fitting for a nation which incorporates such a large number of Muslims to have such a coin for their savings and for commerce. Because the coin, which would be about this size, you see, it would be a really small coin, could be used as money. For any emergency, it is immediately liquid, but people are not going to use it because they're going to use paper for all payments because that is human nature. They're going to use paper for all payments and save the silver for their savings for, for use when they are really are in an emergency. Now, some people might say, well, it's my religious duty to pay with a silver coin. Well, certainly they are, they are entirely free to do so and would be able to do so. However, I predict that most people will save these coins and not use them for payment. That's just my opinion. The social reason, an excellent way to assure the solidarity of the population with its government is for the government to carry out a measure most unusual in our times to provide the population with a means of saving, which is also, also money, by creating a monetized silver coin, the dirham. A tranquil and confident population enjoying a means of savings, which is reliable because it cannot be devalued, is a necessary base for a stable government. This means of saving will exist in parallel with a Malaysian ringgit, which leads, which tends to inflate away the savings of the Malaysian people, especially affecting the most humble. I say this in spite of the fact that I note that over the last several months, the rate of exchange of the ringgit has been stable. Yes, it has been stable with regard to the dollar. But what is happening to the dollar? I mean, that is not a good uh, that is not a good point of reference. We should refer the value of silver and gold. That is well, the true measure of of, uh, of stability. Now we have another reason, the center of gravity reason. 
As long as the Malaysian ringgit is inflating, a condition which must continue for an indefinite period ahead, there is a permanent temptation for Malaysian people to protect themselves from this inflation by acquiring foreign currencies, such as the euro or even the dollar. But if the Malaysian currency itself includes a monetized silver coin, provided in abundance by the government and treasury, the center of gravity is retained in Malaysia itself. The urgent need for protection against inflation is readily available within the country. There is no need for our accumulation of foreign currencies as a hedge for a family or for a business. So that means the center of gravity is within your country and not outside, depending on somebody, some external currency. The political reason. This means that people the people will feel proud to have this currency, and that acts as a cohesive effect of union amongst all the people because they are all dealing, they can deal with each other, and, and they're proud of having this currency, and for special purposes, they, they can use it as money. And they, have a, they are proud of their savings and proud of their independence of themselves and of their country from, on others because the, the silver coin gives you personal security, personal um, assurance of yourself. You don't have to rely on the, the money produced by a banking system of any part of the world. You have your own reserves. If some countries today are, their banks are asking for their gold to be returned, like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela is asking for his, asked for his gold and he took it back to his country. Why shouldn't individuals have their reserves? Only governments? Only central banks? What about individuals? We're the ones that exist, you know. A, a, central, a central bank has no existence. Then the economic reason. An economy built upon money which has no intrinsic value is an unstable economy, and we're seeing this. We're seeing this now, they want stimulus, and they're talking now of trillions, trillions of stimulus. Didn't they learn anything from Zimbabwe? Didn't they learn anything from what happened with Mr. Bono and his Zimbabwe dollars? I mean, we're doing exactly the same thing, and we're repeating the same mistakes of the French Revolution from 1790 to 1797, actually annihilated the French economy by printing up money and increasing amounts, because the amount printed always was insufficient. First it gave a good effect, and then it, things returned to their previous uh, stagnation, so they printed more, and, and the same effect, in other words, stimulus, 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 until in the French Revolution, finally, everybody, in the, the common people were the ones that ended up with the stimulus money, worth nothing, whereas the, the smarter people who had taken advantage had bought properties and objects and houses and things of value and given them and paid for them with papers because they knew where the thing was going to end. So this is totally unjust, a totally riba situation. So, so stability can only be built upon real money. The reintroduction of the monetary silver dirham is only the first step in the direction of stability, but the economy will begin to reap benefits immediately. The monetized silver dirham is a step toward reality as the basis for human interaction. The process of providing this real money to the population of Malaysia will take a generation as it is gradually placed in circulation in parallel with a fiduciary ringgit. Now, it could also, uh, uh, let's see, what, what is my current, uh, I want to mention that in Mexico, uh, 
We have a bank that goes by the name of Banco Azteca, which has established custody accounts for for silver, for one single type of sil of coin, a one ounce Libertad coin, Liberty, Liberty coin, one ounce pure silver coin. And, and some people have taken advantage of this, not too many, but some people have taken advantage of this, of this uh, system of safekeeping their coins under the custody of the bank. But the, the, the person, the individual still owns those coins. They are, they are only we're being warehoused by the bank for the individual. Now, if the coins were monetized, those custody accounts would have a known monetary value and could provide the, an excellent collateral for loans which the owner might want to take out. Uh, some, some are against this system, but others may not be against this system. I do not, I do not, I'm not going to issue an opinion as a foreigner, and I'm not an Islamic, I defer to Sheikh Imran, uh, but there are people who would find it useful to be able to to mobilize their silver coins and obtain ringgits for use in some business in their endeavor and without having to sell their silver. They can still retain the property of the silver, but use it as collateral for loans in, in ringgit. And this would be a good thing for a banking system that is presently creating uh, loans out of nothing, because here, as more and more people have custody accounts and more and more people are using them as collateral, that elevates the quality of the bank because the bank is lending against, uh, against uh, deposits, previous deposits, not creating money out of thin air, it's using previous deposits as collateral. That is very healthy for the economy. That first comes savings, then comes credit. First, today all we read in the Straits Times is more credit, more credit. Everybody wants more credit. This is wrong. We have to start in the world, the whole world. First, save. That was always the elementary lesson of parents to their children. You must learn to save. You must learn to save. But, of course, if we're going to be, have to save papers which are worth nothing after four or five years, well, how are you going to change? How are you going to teach your children to save? This happened to to my children. They saved their their copper coins when they had some value, and then after when they've grown up, they have they have a kilo of, a kilo of copper coins. What good was the savings? I mean, only the idea of saving. So this is what I'm proposing. And do I have some time? Two minutes. Well, I will say goodbye. Uh, I leave you with with my little opus here. I hope you find it of interest, and write me if you if you if you find that uh, that, that the country has monetized the silver dirham. Send me a letter, please.